I want to uh, begin by a uh, overview of what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, what the big data problem is and the cognitive computing problem is in healthcare at a, at a high level. I'm going to talk a little bit about the complexity of the problem. Uh, it's not on most people's radar, and yet it's real, because I'm going to talk about this in the context of patients who are sick and patients who need uh, solutions. I am in my, uh, one of the hats I wear is as a physician, I'm a neuro-oncologist. Uh, I volunteer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Well, volunteer, I'm an attending physician there, pro bono. I guess that counts as volunteer. And um, I've done so for 25 years. So uh, <coughs> my patients, uh, I saw last January as attending physician. Um, unfortunately, not a single one is tapped into what you guys can do. So there's a big gap right now between technology and what patients at the bedside need. So with that, let me just uh, give an overview here. Okay, so this is a fun slide for me. This, this is uh, the biggest discovery in biology, uh, in, in among uh, the biggest ones ever for humankind, I think. This is the uh, announcement uh, of the cracking of the genetic code by the president, uh, whoops. Hit the wrong button here, uh, with Francis Collins, the head of National Institute of Health. Um, and this is the first person ever sequenced, Craig Venter. Um, so this is the kind of uh, thing, as an academician, you want your paper to be announced this way, in an achievement <laughs> that represents a pinnacle of human self-knowledge. Well, that, that's a nice description for a paper. Um, but the details behind it um, is that this, this work costs at least $3 billion to sequence this this man's genome, at least 3,000 people working for many, many years on thousands of machines. Um, so there's a big change uh, that has come to us, which is really the change we've been talking about, the changes of uh, microtechnology and computing power brought uh, to this problem. So this is the, uh, a, a picture of the challenge here. This is uh, part of your X chromosomes. Uh, if you're a woman in the room, I apologize. I uh, well, you've got two of these. Men only have one. Um, so uh, this is just a piece to show you. This is what the genome looks like at a high level. Each of these is a different gene. Um, you've got about 22, 23,000 of these. Um, and it, what we're interested in is which genes cause disease and how do they cause disease. So here's three examples. Uh, I, I'm interested in neurobiology uh, and oncology. This is co a cause of intellectual disability, mutations in this gene, the fragile X gene. Uh, this is associated with autism, and this is associated with myotonic dystrophy. So needle in the haystack immediately becomes an issue here. This is the fragile X gene zooming in. What we want to be able to do, and I'll show you examples of the technology now, uh, we want to be able to sequence within one day uh, a single nucleotide change in a sick child that's not present in the mother and the father. So that's the scope of the problem. And I'll show you some examples, literally, of where we stand in that uh, challenge. Um, so what this means is uh, we have to change the way we do biology and human biology in particular. One uh, paradigm that I like is physics. They've already addressed this problem. Um, this is the paper published in Science a couple of years ago that won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, this was uh, a relatively small problem in my view. We actually generate this much data in about two weeks now at the New York Genome Center. Um, and uh, it's really looking at a collision between two particles. It's a lot more complicated to look at the complexity of multiple dimensions of, of how uh, disease comes about. Um, but nonetheless, not to belittle this, this is the paradigm shift that the physicists have faced, how to do big science. So this is the author list of this paper. It's 2,932 authors, beginning with A and I only got up to B here and had to cut this off. So this is an enormous consortium effort. Um, that really is a paradigm shift that the physicists have faced and conquered in many ways, and biologists have not. Um, so we need to change our paradigm. 
That is really what brought me to uh, the New York Genome Center. I still have a laboratory at Rockefeller University, which I love, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but putting basic science together with clinically actionable change is uh, something we can do this year. We're hoping to enroll our first patient, I'll tell you about this, uh, before the end of the year in collaboration with uh, IBM Watson. So the Genome Center itself um, is first and foremost was an aggregation of machines in New York. Um, we have put about 30 to 40 million dollars into machines. We opened about one year ago. Uh, we are one of two places in the United States that have this thing called an X10 system, which can sequence up to 18,000 Craig Venters a year uh, for about $1,500 each. So it's a complete paradigm shift in what we can do, and it is immediately evident that this is clinically relevant. Uh, to make this work, uh, we have to go back to this physics-like uh, position where we need to be able to do science in a consortium approach. So we have built the Genome Center to be a completely broken, break the mold of academia. So academia is, you know, certainly in the biomedical area, it's R01 NIH-driven research to produce a paper that produces another grant to produce more research. It's an insular area uh, of science by nature. And to that degree where people pull together, they tend to do so within an institution. Um, so the Genome Center is a completely independent institution um, that is built on the shoulders of the 12 academic medical centers and hospitals in New York. And we've now added additional members on there. And we've added our first industry partner, which is IBM. Um, so it's a consortium approach. Um, we have in addition to being connected to all of these different academic centers, we also have in-house faculty. Each of the in-house faculty actually are top class people. Uh, the first one is Tuli Lapalainen, who organized a paper here that had only uh, about 100 authors on it, but she is a consortium scientist. She, this paper had eight different countries involved with it. Um, and all of the faculty that we have, and we've gotten a lot of interest from absolutely top class uh, geneticists and cancer biologists and um, population st stat statisticians and so on, um, they all have joint appointments. So they're all connected in a hub and spoke where the Genome Center is a consortium connected to all of the academia around the tri-state area and ultimately beyond. Um, and it's been productive in, in its first year in producing uh, some really high quality science. So I'll tell you one story about the kind of science that we can do uh, is illustrated, uh, and the way we're going about this illustrated on this paper. So this is the first paper the Genome Center uh, produced, is published in March of this year. Had only 20 collaborators on it, um, but for the first uh, paper that was pretty good. And what the story consisted of was a, an investigator, actually, whose daughter had a rare kind of liver cancer. And uh, they did a kind of genomic analysis that is below the gold standard. Um, I won't go into the details. It was good, but not the gold standard, uh, not using, for example, these X10 systems that we have at the Genome Center. And it was sent down to one of the world's great genomicists at Johns Hopkins. Um, and that uh, genomic scientist, I know, he's a Howard Hughes investigator, he's got a huge number of projects going on in his laboratory. So uh, of the 19 projects he had, this guy came and said, well, could you look at my data? So he looked at this as his 20th project. Part-time, he, he did his due diligence but didn't find anything. Probably a mixture of the fact that he wasn't fully invested, maybe, um, and uh, he didn't have best-in-class technology. So this data went up the East Coast to seven different institutions. Nobody cracked the case. There was nothing special about these tumors that were actionable. Um, they came to the New York Genome Center. We put a team together. We've got about 40 to 45 bioinformatic scientists who are in-house scientists now sitting on top of these machines. So what we've built is not only academia and machines, but in-house um, uh, PhD level scientists. So we put a chunk on this problem for him. We talked through the problem. We, just, we convinced him he should respend money to do this best in class sequencing, sequencing the whole genome from the first base pair to the three billionth. Everybody has three billion base pairs in their DNA. Um, and to do RNA sequencing, which I'll talk some about, uh, paired. 
Uh, this is the state-of-the-art way to do genomic medicine now. And just to give you a, a feeling of how fast and how far this has come, when I was a graduate school, I sequenced uh, a very important piece of DNA, a promoter element in front of a gene that is involved in pregnancy. It's the human chorionic gonadotropin. It was 140 base pairs long. It took me one year to sequence it, so I got one base pair every other day. When we did this project at the Genome Center now, we can sequence 75 million base pairs every second. So that's a 65 trillion fold improvement in technology. And, and I would make the argument that there's nothing like this in biology now. I, I love proteomics, I love metabolomics, there's many different areas of biology that are important to think about, but there's, those things have improved two, five, eight, tenfold since I was a graduate student. Nothing in this category of what's happened in genomics. So this is a genuine revolution in science that is brought to this uh, uh, individual's uh, liver cancers. So what they did in this story was they uh, got 10 kids who had these tumors. Um, several of them had different uh, samples. And within 36 hours, we went from knowing nothing about what caused this cancer to cracking the case and identifying a deletion uh, in the DNA that was first identified actually by looking at the RNA uh, that was present in every child. So every child with this tumor had a different hole here in their DNA and their chromosome that put together one gene that donated an exon to another gene that had a receiving exon. And this first exon, this is the wild type here, uh, was cut out. So basically, it, it put a chimeric construct together, uh, sort of this, this uh, half man, half horse fusion protein, two different pieces of two different genes, completely abnormal. And this, in fact, uh, was the, the publication we did. It, it, it uh, illustrated another point here that the Genome Center is academically involved, but sort of in the middle of this. We're, we're very gracious in try, trying to do, um, empower scientists around the community who are really driven by these problems. But we were the ones who were able to crack the case. And in fact, not only did we identify this fusion protein as two different pieces of, of uh, protein stuck together, but within two months we set up a collaboration with, with the New York Structural Biology Center and they crystallized this chimeric protein. And in fact, what it turns out to be is something very much like the BCR able chimera, which is a famous uh, fusion uh, present in chronic myelogenous leukemia, also known as the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, and the crystal structure of this one shows that there's a little hole here that can be targeted by a drug called Gleevec game changer for people who have CML and a billion dollar drug. Um, so within two months we went from knowing nothing about this tumor to being able to solve the crystal structure of a previously unknown fusion. So it's a wonderful story um, in, in many ways and gratifying for um, the, the kids who have this disease because there's no hope for driving this towards a treatment. So more generally now to come back to, to what genomics can do uh, with some other examples. Um, this is the fragile X gene that I mentioned before I showed to you. Um, the, the problem here is to identify these kinds of mutations, um, the needle in the haystack. Uh, and the easy solutions I'll show you are what people are doing now. So this is an example of a child who came to the Genome Center just when we opened up. Uh, it was a child who had a cardiac defect, was in intensive care unit, just newly born, about two months old. Um, and uh, the doctors at, at Columbia suspected this child might have a uh, genetic cause for this conge uh, presumed congenital anomaly in the heart. So the DNA came to the Genome Center, and this is time. Uh, within hours, numbering about 50, we could do the following. So in the first day, we got the DNA from the child, we got the DNA from the mother, and the DNA from the father. They went on three separate machines. Each machine can sequence the entire genome uh, start to finish in one day. Uh, so at the end of that day, that data was aggregated, uh, put through a computational pipeline, and by the end of six days, unbelievably, the three billion base pairs from the mother, the three billion base pairs from the father, and the three billion base pairs from the child found one nucleotide difference, a true needle in a haystack. And that nucleotide caused a mutation in a gene called the ARID1B. Um, that was the underlying cause of the heart defect and led to a definitive diagnosis and a treatment plan for that child. So some more robust examples. 
Um, this one I love. This is a, a mutation uh, that David Goldstein has worked on. David Goldstein is a top tier geneticist, was at Duke until two weeks ago. He's just moved to New York to be associated with the New York Genome Center and Columbia University. And uh, this is a child who is getting weak, uh, had a funny eye movement disorder that I'm actually going to show you a video of, um, and had trouble walking at about the age of two. So it had done fine for two years and then started to develop a motor weakness. Um, and in fact, uh, a single point mutation was found the same way in this child, in this gene. And th why is this important? This turns out to be a uh, defect in a pathway of vitamin B6 metabolism. So this child was given riboflavin, and two weeks later, the weakness was getting better. Two months later, came back to the clinic, was high-fiving every doctor in the room. So a very wonderful, gratifying story of uh, real-life power of genetics. Um, <clears throat> This one illustrates another complicated point. This is a gene in a potassium, uh, a mutation in a potassium channel in a series of kids who have epilepsy. And in, in these kids, it turns out that depending on where the mutation is in the gene, what part of the protein it affects, they can, they can be treated with a drug called quinidine, uh, which increases the conduction of that channel. But other kids uh, are insensitive to quinidine and, in fact, Giving them quinidine, increasing the conductivity is the last thing you'd want to do for a child who has epilepsy. So the same muta the, the, mutation in the same gene but in different places is highly informative uh, in terms of the actual clinical consequences and the treatment. So this is an important point that a gene is not a gene is not a gene. There, there's biology in every single one of these cases and that's a point I want to come back to. And this one is just an amazing story also. So uh, this is a story well publicized, so I'm not disclosing anything. Uh, the first woman who got sequenced was Glenn Close, the movie actress, who's a great friend of ours at the Genome Center. Um, so Glenn um, got herself sequenced because um, she had two sisters who had neuropsychiatric disease, different diseases, different diagnoses. Very interesting. So over time, the sisters got sequenced, the family got sequenced, and what fell out of that analysis was that both of the sisters, who had different diseases, had mutations that were turned out to be the same in a gene uh, called glycine decarboxylase uh, that meant that they didn't have enough glycine. Now, glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so if you don't have enough inhibition, that's a double negative. You have too much, so they had a manic depressive illness in one case, and in obsessive compulsive sort of disorder in another case. Um, and glycine is something you can buy at a health food store. It's an amino acid. So they gave these two sisters glycine. And Tom Insel, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, has written this story uh, and tells it that I never saw these patients. But when they got the glycine, it was like giving insulin to a diabetic. Right away, they got better. These were adult women with completely different clinical diagnoses. So our understanding of medicine is incredibly rudimentary right now. The power of this technology in genomics can change the world. The weakness in every case that I've told you about is what? Being pedantic professorial. Um, the weakness is these are all one-off cases. These are all you know, wonderful academic case reports. What's missing is a scalable solution. That's, that's why I'm here. We're at IBM, right? We're, we're going to make this a scalable solution. So uh, part of the um, problem in making this a scalable solution is we just don't understand enough about the biology of what is going on in genomics. The, the, of course, the cases by self-selection that I've told you are the ones that we've solved. In, in reality, we solve a minority of uh, cases where people have medical problems, and I would argue in every Every case of a person who's sick, genomics is relevant. It's either causative or indirectly plays a very important role. Happy to debate that. So part of the weakness that we have now is we just don't understand uh, very much biology. So this is the central dogma. DNA, uh, this stuff, uh, gets copied into RNA. And that RNA, which is the copy of the DNA here, gets translated into protein down here. So here's the fragile X gene. There's one child who's been described, for example, who has an isoleucine asparagine mutation in the protein, and you can see that at both the RNA and the DNA level. Now, as it turns out, 
That cheap form of sequencing that I talked about is this stuff, uh, the exome. So it's really the copy of the DNA, but it's not the real copy of the DNA. So just to uh, make you suffer along with me a little bit, um, this is what the uh, genome really looks like. Um, it's this. Um, so this is the DNA. It gets copied from position one to the last position here where a polyadenylation signal gets put on. But that copy is chopped up into different pieces and there's combinatorial complexity here which is enormously important. So these, these pieces are called exons and the intervening sequences are cut out. Those are introns. Uh, the, that was a, a one Nobel Prize right there. Um, and what we know is that these can either be in or out leading to a binary system, a one or a zero. Many, probably most genes in the, that are ever made have this binary component to them. Most of the ones in the nervous system, not to make life more difficult for those thinking about the brain, most of them have 10 or more of these alternative exons in them. So that's two to the 10th variables uh, for a single protein. And of course, that makes many different protein variants that are contributory to disease, like the fragile X syndrome can have a mutation in this exon that can either be in or out. Um, so this sort of analysis of the quick and dirty exome misses all of the complexity, and I, I won't perseverate too much on it, but a little bit. Um, so why is this important? Um, these spots here are sparse information in deep data sets. And these sparse bits, and I'm reflecting comments from this morning, these sparse bits of information have lots of clinical relevance to them, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I think that's true. Um, so why I think that's true has to do with my entree into genomics. Uh, I am a neuro-oncologist. This is a patient who has this opsoclonus ataxia syndrome, so perineoplastic syndrome. So what this means is clinically the patient can't stop his eye movements, and at rest he's perfectly well, but when he gets up, that's me by the way, when he gets up he can't stop his motor movements. So he has a double negative, a failure to inhibit motor systems, and it turns out that the original cases here um, were studied in detail by me at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center with Jerry Posner, my, my clinical mentor. And this is a disease where a patient has lung cancer but doesn't know he has it. That lung cancer illustrated here is making proteins that are normally made only in the brain. That triggers a tumor immune response. This is an area of great interest in uh, pharma companies now, uh, the so-called checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, are drugs that mimic tumor immunity. And this was really the first discovery of effective tumor immunity. These people make immune responses to their cancer. The tumor is suppressed, but then a second event occurs is that immune response against the tumor crosses into the brain, attacks the neurons that are normally inhibiting the motor system in this case, um, and then the patient rapidly comes to clinical attention. Now, the entree and the connection between this and genomics is unexpected. I was able to develop technologies as a young scient younger scientist uh, to uh, take blood from these patients, clone the, the genes that were encoding these proteins, and ask what are these genes and start to get into the nitty gritty of the biology. That turns out to be important in genomics. So we absolutely need to go from the patient to the science to make animal models of these diseases. And in this case, what fell out of this um, so this is an animal that's knocked out in the protein that's under attack here. So we know lots and lots about what's going on here. And what fell out last year is we've now found four patients who are missing this gene. This is one of these patients, this child who's given us permission to show this. He's trying to hold still um, while well, his brother tells the story, but he can't. He has what's called stereotypies. Um, it's actually a form frust, I believe, of something called Tourette's syndrome. So, uh, this genetic connection now is something we are making all over the place that was unexpected uh, from biology even a few years ago. And a, a key point here is that the, genetic, uh, the genetics needs to be attached to the biology and the clinical uh, manifestations of disease to really make progress in how to treat people. So in this case, what fell out of cloning the genes for this patient who I showed you and other patients who have other of these perineoplastic diseases was that uh, this led to the discovery that the brain, and specifically neurons, since we talked about them earlier, I thought I'd show this picture, neurons have their own system for regulating 
DNA and RNA. And in fact, what we discovered is um, that what's under attack here uh, in these syndromes are proteins that are RNA binding proteins, not DNA binding proteins. So again, to return to this point, here's a single neuron in, in the brain. This could be a cortical neuron, although it's not. Um, the DNA is stuck here in the nucleus and is the important driver of disease. But the copy of that DNA into the RNA has all of this binary complexity. And in fact, the RNA can be dragged out into the dendrites uh, that were discussed earlier. So these dendrites have little bits of genetic material in them. And so do these. And that little bits of genetic material can be differentially regulated to cause a stronger synapse here or a new synapse perhaps to form and this one to be weakened or a synapse to disappear. So the complexity of the system really relates back to RNA biology. I'm not going to go into it, but it's simply to say that to really put together the clinical manifestations with the genomics, you really need to do detailed biochemistry. Um, and that detailed biochemistry tells you about function, and the way that function has gone forward is to identify now, for the first time, connections between sparse information in deep data sets. So uh, this is a technology that we developed in our laboratory. It's analogous to other technologies you may have heard about in the so-called epigenetic space. Um, so beyond the, the standard genetics are these other areas of information. So the technology we developed was to be able to cross-link sites of regulation. Um, and they were very bulky technologies, early, early uh, next generation genomics from 10 years ago, which we were able to get 300 or 400 of these little pieces of points of regulation. Um, and now fast forwarding using high technology with next generation sequencing, this is the sort of curve you've probably seen before. We, we started this project here on the curve, and now we get billions of bits of information per experiment. And that leads to being able to take this sort of technology from 10 years ago and get many, many bits of, uh, these are little RNA fragments where proteins are touching in this uh, sparse data. Uh, and so how does that lead to um, a deeper understanding of genomics than just a gene being present or absent? Um, because this is a problem we need to think about. So this is a disease called frontotemporal dementia and Parkinson's disease. It's got uh, 14 of these exons separated each by an intervening sequence, the intron. And it's known that this exon, R2, can either be present or absent. So you'll get three of these repeated domains or four repeated domains. And in fact, if you have a mutation that causes you to have four of these domains, you get this disease, really a terrible, uh, a terrible degenerative disease. So here's the sparse distributed data. This is using this technology called CLIP, again, that our lab developed. Um, this is a single site where one of these regulatory proteins binds in the C of this dotted line here is the intron, and these boxes are the exons, the coding sequence for the protein. So this information is something that's invisible without better technology. In fact, seeing this information, we know that the regulatory protein that we've identified related to this shaking, um, that regulatory binds right at this spot. Early in development, this is early developing mouse neocortex, harking back to this morning's talk again. And if we look at other proteins a little later, after mice have been born or are young adolescents, we see other proteins bind to this hot spot. So, in fact, these are all the binding sites. These colors represent binding sites. There's a single dot here and here. This is noise. This is a hot spot for regulation. Um, but there's variants all scattered through here. So trying to do an analytic approach to understand what variant is important and what variant isn't has now, you know, gone from just looking at the coding sequence to look at the changes in the protein to identifying variants in this uh, vast data set. Um, that, in fact, are informative. In fact, what we know is that this protein, the Nova protein, gets bumped off uh, later in life by these competing regulatory proteins onto two other spots that we never knew about before. And these spots, in fact, um, would cause this exon to be included just when you don't want it to be in patients at risk for frontotemporal dementia and Parkinson's. And in fact, we, since we know exactly what that sequence is now for, through this high-throughput genomic technology, we can make compounds that block the binding of this regulatory protein and switch the inclusion of this exon from being 
uh, included to be skipped, which would ameliorate the disease. So it's a, a complicated story, but I want to take you through it because this was brought up earlier, uh, sparse distributed data, and we are living in that space right now. We need help. It's just obvious for me as a clinician trying to think about how to treat patients in an intelligent way. We need help uh, on, on, from cognitive computing. Uh, here's another example in the cancer space. Um, this is a, a different kind of regulatory protein. It's a, a microRNA binding protein that deposits microRNAs where these green stars are and these other spots here. And in fact, we have found that uh, in lung cancer, this sort of deposition disappears, changing the amount of expression uh, of, the, of a particular oncogene. So these are mutations that are important in lung metastases. They're not so important in bone metastases but they are present in, in breast, uh, so this sort of regulation is switching between breast cancer that's primary and breast cancer that's metastatic. And this is a genetic variation of some sort that happens in the course of going from a primary to a metastatic tumor. Um, and it's specific and uh, it illustrates something else that's very important that came up earlier today, which is it's really not the presence or absence of this oncogene that's very important in this transformation of primary to metastatic cancer. It's the stoichiometry of this protein because what these, these points are telling us here is that the regulation of this, this is outside of the coding sequence, this is the non-coding sequence, again, this sparse information. Um, the regulation, the tuning of whether this is made is not black or white, it's simply stoichiometrically turned down and that tuning leads to metastatic cancer. So, in fact, 90% of women with breast cancer died not from the cancer itself, but from the metastases. So this is absolutely critical information to understand about how cancer works. And just to make the point and drive it home a little bit more, a paper we just published um, showing that the loss of one of these regulatory proteins that's binding to these spots uh, is associated with uh, a worse prognosis in patients, the blue versus the red. Um, so these are clinically important observations in dealing with this uh, sparse information. So how do we try and deal with it? So this is a real piece of data. This is a patient of ours who had an ovarian malignancy. And this is, uh, this is what we have done. Uh, so this is typical of what we're doing uh, going forward, and I'll tell you a little bit about the trial we're doing with IBM. But, um, what, what happens specifically is we capture cancer tumor from the operating room in patients, we sequence the tumor, and then we sequence the normal DNA from the blood, compare the two, take away everything that's in common, and what we're left with is the mutations. Now, the number of mutations in a cancer may number up to as many as 10,000 mutations just in the coding sequence without all this sparse information. So there's an enormous problem of uh, variation in the tumor compared to the normal. What we do is we try and winnow that down and literally are doing this by hand prior to coming to IBM. So this is a winnowed list here of about uh, our top 100 candidates that had mutations in genes that we thought were important for a variety of reasons. And that candidate list um, is listed here with the actual mutations themselves. Uh, here's a glycine 142 to a serine mutation, for example, in this gene. And this is the guy who, who looked at it. Uh, so we literally go through this data um, one gene at a time to look it up in the literature. We go to Google, we go to PubMed, we try and uh, read about it. For 100 genes, it's on the borderline of being untenable for one patient. We could easily spend a week or two on this patient. And we actually did find some interesting things here. But um, to do this at scale, uh, it's absolutely impossible, as you can imagine. So the, the variables that we need to make this work in a clinical scenario are A, to capture the tumor. In, in this case, it was ovarian cancer. With IBM, we're doing this as a prototype trial in glioblastoma patients, going to the operating room, capturing the tumor. We bring it into the genome center. With these new X10 uh, sequencers, which are shown here, $10 million investment, um, we can sequence these rapidly do that comparison I just told you about. Then this is the informatics team in-house at the Genome Center who are integrating with the team um, here at IBM. 
So uh, Ajay has been a, a team leader and John has been an uh, incredible support in making this work and I've just absolutely treasured every minute of our uh, set of interactions. So this team struggling here is now being empowered by trying to bring the power of IBM Watson uh, to uh, these kinds of tumors. So we're doing this as a prototype in part to convince ourselves that we're on the right path in part to see what are the bottlenecks uh, in actually making this scalable. So the bottlenecks are several. Um, big data itself is, is not only a, a bottleneck in trying to deal with different patients who have different kinds of sets of mutations here, um, but we, want, we need it to be scalable and we need it to be time sensitive. So part of that is this consortium approach. So we have not only uh, IBM as our key partner here, but we have all these academic institutions illustrated by this graph here who are centered around the Genome Center. Um, and that includes academic partners who are smart informaticists. Uh, it is, again, essentially every academic center in New York. We meet regularly uh, at, at many, many different levels at the Genome Center, which I invite you to come to. Um, and uh, we are on the verge of making very interesting and solid collaborations with pharma, healthcare providers, and we need government help. And the state of New York has given us $55 million, um, which was voted into law in March and actually came to us last week. Um, so that was a rapid time scale for New York. Um, so uh, the other point to make here is that we can't do this scalable analysis without getting the data in. So that becomes a rate-limiting bottleneck in and of itself. How do we get the data and acquire it, and what kind of data do we need? Um, I could talk about that, but um, in essence, what we need is to do this in a way that is illustrated here. So what we're concentrating on now is patients with disease, cancer, glioblastoma, all other kinds of cancers. Um, we want to collect the data in a way that is correct um, ethically and ethnically. So it's, it captures both the vast data and the variety of data in different kinds of people, and is done in a way that's thoughtful so that we don't disenfranchise accidentally or, or otherwise any one part of the population. So by collecting New York City, of course, is the perfect place to do genomics because it has the greatest diversity in the world. So we, we want to be able to capture um, different kinds of patients who have different ages and different diseases. Um, and an interesting overlay now that I'm becoming more and more fascinated with is that understanding what's going on di in disease patients can really be done as a controlled experiment where this ethnic diversity and this age can be matched with the same ethnic diversity and the same age of patients who are well. And of course, if you do that for kids who are 0 to 10, they'll be different from kids who are 0 to 10 who have disease. So it's sort of like the mom and the dad and the child, but there's also a population of children who are well and a population of children who are ill. So it's a higher level way to think about this comparison. And of course, as people get older, unfortunately, we all go from blue to, blue to red. So understanding um, how that transition goes is actually where the healthcare revolution has to go. Uh, we will go broke as a nation and a world if this is all we concentrate on. What we really want to do is use these large data sets to empower us to understand what are the antecedents to disease. Um, and I'd love to talk about that more uh, at the next session because uh, they're really, this is a, a critical thing to think about. Um, but of course, this is what you want to know. If you actually have a genetic mutation in your LDL receptor um, and you find out when you're 42, a week before, a week after you've had your first heart attack, uh, and then a doctor, when you're sick, tests you and says, oh, this is why you had a heart attack at age 42. That's partially good to know, but it would have been a lot better to have that sequence done when you were 20 um, and knew that you had to be on Lipitor and watch your diet more than all of us have to do. You're, you're an outlier. Um, so there are sets of diseases now. There's 58 genes that are clinically actionable, that it would benefit you to have your sequence done for those 58 today. And it would benefit everybody in your family, I would make the argument. Um, and the cost is such that we can actually start to think about how to do this. And in the process, we, we gather data. And that data is a virtuous cycle. <clears throat> it gives us more power and more information for understanding this conversion. 
So that's it. I just want to uh, conclude by saying um, the overall challenges to the cognitive genetic community, which I will christen you, um, are several. Um, first of all, we can't do everything. We are time constrained because we have sick patients. I have sick patients. You are all patients at one level or another. Your family are all patients. Time is a major constraint. And for me, the focus is clinical actionable change. OK, so that's the, the focus of the many interesting things you could do with genomics. What we want to do is drive it to change people's lives. Uh, it's essential, as the last slide was pointing out, to, do, uh, to gather the data to make this revolution happen. Um, and again, I think not only does it have to be done in, in an ethically correct way to capture diversity, another interesting lecture is what happened to genomics in the 1920s. It was a disaster um, that was the precursor to the Holocaust. So this is a very important thing to think about. And at the same time, there's big issues in data security. If we're going to be sequencing people, we need to protect their data. Um, so this is an area where we can also collaborate, I think, with IBM. Um, and then finally, the analytics. The big problem here is, I think, listening to everything I've heard today, um, is that we need human-machine interactions to make this, this work. Um, so that's what I'm excited about. So um, there's our website. You're welcome to come visit us. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's, uh, let's take a few questions on uh, the last talk of the day, but let's, let's have a well, Yeah, go ahead. And then maybe another one back here if somebody can get the mic. Thanks for an excellent talk. So when kids are born today, they get a battery of tests. Do you see a time when a kid will get sequenced at birth? And when do you see that happening? Yes. Um, I think uh, it should probably be done right now. Um, so right now, every child in New York has their heel pricked with no consent um, because it's deemed in the common good. And that heel prick, a little drop of blood goes into old-fashioned assays, I would say, 50 assays or so, um, that are good. They look for things like phenylketonuria, that if you identify it at birth and you just avoid phenylketones in the diet, the child's normal. If you don't find out about it, the child is devastated, the family's devastated, society's devastated in terms of costs and, and every possible way it's a negative. So that was the original uh, example of why uh, genomics should be done in every child. They just didn't call it genomics then. It's mass spectrometry, color metric assays, old fashioned, inefficient. The, the, we're at already the crossing point where it's probably cheaper and better to do it by uh, genomic sequencing. The issues are interesting ethical ones. So if you test your child, um, do you want to know that that child is at risk for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, or that that child is at risk for Huntington's disease, a disease for which we can't cure and is a, a terrible travesty in, in middle age. Um, you know, each person needs to be empowered to make that decision. So that's the essence of the answer. So I think the answer is in place. It's not that complicated, but everybody's head is spinning about it, so nothing's happening yet. Question yes. back here. Um, <clears throat> fascinating talk. Yeah. Um, one of the areas of uh, complexity that probably you could mention, but I would like you to comment on, is the fact that uh, within the tumor itself, there is heterogeneity in, in uh, yeah. the genomics that you can find. Mm -hmm. So how to handle that? So what you're referring to there is um, what we call tumor heterogeneity. You're absolutely correct. This is a big area of research right now, is that uh, even in glioblastoma, we know the center of the tumor is necrotic. The cells in the periphery may be somewhat different in terms of their mitotic index. And the cells that ultimately kill the patient are ones that have migrated out. And they undoubtedly all have slightly different genetic profiles. So there's big debate about whether that should hold us up from trying to do sequencing and treatment connections um, or whether we should um, put that aside for the moment. I, of course, I'm a have your cake and eat it too person. So the answer in my view is, until proven otherwise, I want to figure out what's going wrong in the bulk of the cells that are killing my patients. Um, and that is, you know, the mutations that are relatively easy to see in 999 out of 1,000 cells. Now, it's true that one in 1,000 cells may be 
the real troublemaker that's going to, even if you cut the tumor out, which we do in glioblastoma, everybody dies. It's a death sentence. It's about 12 months from start to finish, unfortunately. Um, so those recurrent cells are a trouble. Uh, on the other hand, um, identifying the bulk of the tumor and seeing the mutations that are present in the 999 cells will undoubtedly improve the prognosis of the patients. And then it remains to be seen whether you really have to target that one in a thousand cell or not. So there, uh, that said, it is such an important question that the Genome Center has a technology innovation center and in collaboration with Columbia and other places around the city, um, we are uh, working on the technology which is here now, which is to be able to take a single cell, one cell, and sequence its entire RNA profile and its whole genome. So each cell will be slightly different because they have different mutations. So the technology is here to do it. It's a research area right now. Rob, let's take one Hi. last question. Back here. Hello. Oh, there, right here. Hi. I, recently, there have been some articles in the New York Times and other places. I'm over here. Oh, okay. Here You're I am. You're way, way out up there. Yes. Here I go. Maybe I need some uh, genetic uh, sequencing to find me. <laughs> I'm sure you do. At any, <laughs> hey, I, I'll give you some DNA later if you want. You know, you can scrape the inside of my cheek or something. I'll give you some cheek cells. So the New York Times and other uh, uh, recently uh, other uh, mainstream press have had articles about epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And the implications to a layman like me is, well, you may be born with a certain DNA, but over time that can change. So if that's true, um, maybe... It, Maybe uh, uh, checking somebody's DNA at 42 and saying there's a genetic defect, if you had checked them at 20, may not have shown up. Um, are you considering doing longitudinal studies, DNA studies, so you have, let's say everybody gets sequenced at, uh, at birth and then 10 years later and 10 years later and 10 years later and 10 years later, so you can actually see how the changes, yeah. potentially, okay. from an epigenetic standpoint, yeah. change. Great, great question. I, 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 well, I don't know who paid you off to ask that. Um, so it, it's a little more complicated. The DNA itself doesn't really change. GATC remains GATC. Uh, and what changes is the modifications of the DNA and the proteins that hit them. And that's sort of what I was getting to with this clip data, this, these maps, where um, there, there are covalent modifications to the G residues, for example, um, that change the binding of proteins and change, at the end of the day, not really so much the DNA, but the RNA output, whether the DNA is making a lot of RNA or no RNA or somewhere in between. So it really goes back to this question of the stoichiometry and complexity of the RNA. So epigenetics, in my view, is really a study of RNA complexity. Um, and that said, um, Yes, it's a very important idea. And so, in fact, we have our second clinical trial that we're doing now, which is incredibly fun and interesting and is going to be clinically a blockbuster, is um, a longitudinal study uh, over time in patients who have inflammatory disease. We're starting in rheumatoid arthritis. And what we're doing, you know, that's an inflammatory disease. So drawing the blood and looking at the white blood cells is relevant to the disease in some direct or maybe somewhat indirect way, but it's still the relevant cell type. We're capturing, so this is really interesting, we're capturing the blood by taking little finger pricks um, that you know, a diabetic would do to check their blood glucose. We're just teaching the patients to do that at home, capturing the blood and sticking it in a barcoded tube in their freezer. Um, and at the same time, we're, so we're collecting longitudinal data on the RNA profile of those white blood cells. And we can do epigenetic profiling on the DNA as well. But uh, I just wanted to say that we're overlaying on that um, iPhone application um, with, with Deborah Estrin at Cornell Technion, where um, she's monitoring um, as an initial instance in this trial the location of the patient over time on a daily basis. And what she's finding, um, preliminary data, uh, is that the antecedents, to go back to that idea, of the flare in rheumatoid arthritis, um, well, she's done this in Crohn's disease, a related inflammatory disease. The antecedents to uh, getting a flare and getting sick in the disease can be seen because the profile of where the patient is walking and traveling over the course of the day 
gets more constricted as they're starting to feel lousy. And before they get a big blow up in their flare, we can get a tip off. And why the, that's really important to me is instead of collecting blood drops maybe every other day, we can call the patient up and say, you know, it looks like there's a red flag here. Start collecting your blood every hour or every six hours or whatever you're able to do. And that will allow us to try and identify genetically by looking at the RNA profile, the antecedents to getting sick. That's really what I'm interested in doing. Bob, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.